Hello psychology, welcome to the psychology of learning. Learning is defined as any relatively permanent change in behavior due to experience. When I ask you what learning means, uh, you might think of cramming for a test or some type of studying for an exam, possibly uh, learning a new instrument or learning a new skill. However, when psychologists talk about learning, they're talking about something a little bit different because they also recognize uh, the learning of reflex actions. So if you will re recall from chapter one, we talk briefly about Pavlov. Pavlov uh, gave us classical conditioning. Classical conditioning uh, really developed out of his uh, physiological research on the digestion of dogs. He was interested in their reflex actions. Specifically, he was interested in how saliva was used for digestion. However, what he did not realize, what he did not plan on discovering, uh, was that when he walked into his laboratory, they began salivating and this created for him a research question. He then developed a hypothesis and implemented his hypothesis in a famous psychological research. Now he was not intending on changing the world of psychology. Word has it that he did not even like psychology because it was at the time uh, very rooted in sort of Freudian ideas and things that he would have deemed unmeasurable. So he began studying this hypothesis that he had. He took baseline measurements of how much saliva dogs emitted when presenting food. Uh, then he began ring, ringing a bell every time he presented food. Ringing a bell, presenting food. Ringing a bell, presenting food. And after some time, he implemented his experimental condition, which is he removed the food and rang the bell. The dogs began salivating and he took a measurement and found they were salivating just as much as when he was ringing, when he was just presenting the food. So he effectively um, discovered classical conditioning. He called it uh, classical conditioning because he conditioned or he taught or the dogs learned to associate a neutral stimulus that does not normally cause salivation, uh, the ringing of a bell, just neutral, but when paired with an unconditioned stimulus, when paired with something that does normally cause salivation, then in time the dogs can be conditioned. And this would lay an important foundation for psychology. How does someone develop a phobia? If someone goes to war and they come back traumatized with post-traumatic stress, how is this developed? Well, it's developed through classical conditioning. A person may grow up hunting, shooting guns, uh, as many of my students do in Mississippi here. And what happens is it's something that's neutral, does not cause any kind of traumatic response. But if individuals go to war and they have loud noises and explosions and then they have these traumatic experiences of friends dying, then all of a sudden the sound of a loud explosion or a gun shooting uh, can trigger emotional trauma. And so to understand this, we got to understand classical conditioning. To know how we might help someone with post-traumatic stress, or someone who has become a victim of sexual violence. Um, we have to understand how this takes place. So some classical concepts that we need to know. The unconditioned stimulus is that which is unlearned. So for Pavlov, it was dog food. The unconditioned stimulus, or UCS, produces the unconditioned response or the UCR. If you have a pet, your animal has been um, 
did displaying right an unconditioned response of salivating and getting excited when you present food the dog food is unconditioned however if you have uh, animals you have inevitably experienced they've also uh, you've also seen classical conditioning so for instance let's say you keep this dog food in a cabinet and now it's it's uh, 11 o'clock at night and you're going into that same cabinet for something else you open up the cabinet and the dog hears the sound of that squeaking cabinet and comes flying in any time of the day if you open up that cabinet the dog will come in sometimes my students will tell me that their dogs are conditioned to run to the door and knock excuse me run to the door and, and bark when they hear someone driving up a gravel driveway uh, also if you have cows and you feed cows uh, with a bucket right just carrying any bucket will cause the cows to come running if you feed your cows on the back of your truck just cranking up a truck or a tractor or a four-wheeler may uh, trigger the cows physiological responses but these are all examples of, of conditioning in real life some other examples would be uh, spiders uh, we are conditioned to be afraid of spiders we are conditioned to get excited at the sound of the ice cream truck and we are conditioned to hate the dentist some students will tell me even passing the dentist office will give them a physiological response they'll start to feel anxious they'll get worried some students report going into the, the lobby of their routine dental cleaning and they experience tension in their shoulders and this is the basis of how panic happens how panic attacks, uh, are developed it's what uh, Watson would call conditional responses so before conditioning, the ring of a bell is neutral and it produces no response in the dog. However, during conditioning, the bell is paired with the unconditioned stimulus of dog food and this will produce the unconditioned response of salivation. After conditioning, however, we will see that the conditioned stimulus of the bell produces salivation by itself. Now, in time, the conditioned response will eventually die out if it is not occasionally paired with something to reinforce. So this is called extinction. Uh, and so through the years, behavioral psychologists have built upon Pavlov's experiment. Here's one example. Here you see a piano keyboard on the left. So I don't have any. I don't know if I have any piano players. I don't know if I have any musicians here, but you'll know the keyboard here. If you're a musician, you can find the notes. Uh, psychologists have conditioned dogs to salivate at the sound of a piano note. So what they will do is play. Uh, the the A note here they will play an A an A note and give food to the dog and they will do this repetitively establishing a, a conditioned response when they play the A dogs salivate and then uh, the experimental condition in this research study uh, after the dogs are conditioned to expect food when playing the A note they simply move one key up to the B note, which would be right here. Uh, and what they found is that as they move up to the C note, the further away they get from the original conditioned stimulus, the weaker the response. So this is called uh, stimulus generalization. Uh, so playing an A sharp, for instance, uh, this would be right here playing an, an a sharp would would emit some response playing a b uh, less response 
and then eventually going all the way up to the same note further up on the keyboard, uh, then there's less and less and less response. So this is interesting just to give psychologists understanding of how, how conditioning takes place. So with, uh, this is called acquisition, the point at which a research subject or the point at which a person in real life becomes uh, conditioned. This can happen through traumatic experience. It can happen through ordinary life experiences. In time, if we do not continue to have this reinforced, uh, extinction can take place. So therapists basically are trying to use extinction. They're trying to uh, cure traumatic response by having a person progressively exposed to the feared stimuli, the feared stimulus, uh, without having panic, without having flashbacks, without having um, you know, these traumatic memories. Uh, classical conditioning happens throughout our life. It can happen in something as simple as having uh, the pictures of our loved ones. When we have pictures of our loved ones in our offices, we look at them and we feel very happy. Um, and this is giving us an emotional response. Um, so the sight of a loved one uh, paired with, with uh, physical intimacy gives us a physiological response. And in, tight, in time, simply seeing our loved ones can give us the physiological response. Three other concepts here. Uh, we can experience some kind of traumatic experience through vicarious conditioning. So seeing a loved one go through trauma can actually uh, produce traumatic experiences. Uh, also taste aversion. So with taste aversion, uh, we find a food that we like and we're eating this food and we have a bad experience, then we can lose all appetite for this food item. We can actually be taste averted. And this is an example of classical conditioning. So in terms of biological preparedness, this basically speaks to the fact that we're biologically pre-programmed. Our, our biology is trying to keep us alive. So, uh, you know, our, perhaps our ancestors would eat a plant and it was poisonous and they almost died. Well, your brain is telling you that plant will kill you and you lose the appetite for it. That's a very, it's, it's adaptive, it's very beneficial to have that. However, um, our brains work very much the same way. In a system designed really to keep us safe and to keep us alive, sometimes it can cause us traumatic experiences. So for instance, you, you love clowns as a kid and watch a scary clown movie, then all of a sudden you see clowns and you have a panic. Uh, that's your brain trying to protect you from that which you perceive to be a threat. Um, oftentimes, if kids see their mother scream and jump at seeing a, a spider or a bug, well, then this can be con this can condition them quite literally. So, Pavlov believed that the classical conditioned stimulus occurs when, in close proximity of time, the unconditioned stimulus came to activate the same place in the animal's brain that was originally activa activated by the unconditioned stimulus. So he called this stimulus substitution. So he would say that when he displayed and gave food for the dogs and they began, began to salivate, this was activating the same place in the mind, same place in the brain uh, that was activated when the dog sees food. It's substituting. And this is what psychologists mean oftentimes when they talk about learning. When we talk about operant conditioning, we're actually talking about something uh, a little different.
So, excuse me, when we're talking about uh, operant conditioning, we are actually looking at uh, what I call frontal lobe learning. You could say we're asking what's in it for me. And this is building upon Thorndike's law of effect. Thorndike's law of effect said that responses followed by uh, pleasurable consequences will be repeated. So this is marked by the puzzle box. A very famous experiment Thorndike created by which he locked a cat in a box and there was a puzzle mechanism by which the cat could get out of the box. And he demonstrated his hypothesis and, and tested the hypothesis first and then demonstrated that the time it took the, the cats to break out of the puzzle box decreased. So as cats were rewarded for their successful completion of this puzzle with escape, well then all of a sudden they learned. And so from this, Thorndike uh, proved that we are, uh, that, that, that learning can take place with reinforcement, positive reinforcement. B.F. Skinner, the radical behaviorist, would also make inroads into operant conditioning. He studied observable, measurable behavior. Uh, he studied operant, voluntary behavior. So whereas classical conditioning with Pavlov uh, and John Watson with Baby Albert really studied what I call autonomic learning, how our fear was conditioned through experience. But B.F. Skinner studied what I call frontal lobe learning, um, voluntary behavior. You wear a shirt to school and you get all kinds of positive feedback, so you're more likely to wear a similar shirt, uh, that kind of thing. He said that learning depends on consequences and also expected competence. You expect to get positive reinforcement. This, would, this is where social learning theory would come in, building upon the work of B.F. Skinner and the operant folks. So learning is a reflex. Uh, learning a reflex really depends on what comes before the response or the antecedent. But in operant conditioning, learning depends on what happens after the response or the consequence. So in a way, operant conditioning could be summed up as this, what's in it for me? And we talk about reinforcement, which is any consequence that makes a response more likely. school district several years ago made news in their plan to improve test scores. They proposed the idea of paying kids for A's and B's. And I asked my students about this and over the years I've gotten all kinds of responses. Some say we should learn for the sake of learning because it's the right thing. Others say they would have done a lot better in school had they gotten paid. However, the basic premise or the theory is incentivization or incentivizing good or desired behavior. And we do this with reinforcement. Reinforcement can be primary. Primary reinforcers meet a basic biological need or drive such as food. A secondary reinforcer occurs when we pair a primary reinforcer. So for instance, uh, a gold medal is a secondary reinforcer. Um, a sticker on a piece of paper is a secondary reinforcement reinforcer. Great job, way to go. Uh, social reinforcers. Uh, these can be very, very powerful. And eventually what happens is, from the SRS operant theory, um, we have an antecedent stimulus. Uh, we make an action and we have a consequent stimulus and this leads to other antecedent stimuli. So you have a final exam for culinary arts school, so you decide to spend time preparing, you pass the test and graduate, uh, and then this creates an, an, a, a learned behavior. 
by which you're going to study, you're going to prepare and um, and work very hard in the kitchen in order to get good results, pay raises, good jobs. So we have different types of reinforcement. You have positive, which is the addition of a pleasurable stimulus, and negative reinforcement. Now, a lot of times, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, students confuse this. Students will confuse negative reinforcement with punishment. This is not punishment. Reinforcement is anything that increases likelihood of behavior. So negative reinforcement is essentially the removal, escape, or avoidance of an aversive stimulus that increases likelihood or probability of behavior. So let me give you some examples. I drink coffee at 8 o'clock to prevent headaches at 12 o'clock. Um, a person who is an alcoholic drinks alcohol in the, as soon as they wake up to prevent the withdrawal symptoms that will happen. You have a headache, you take an aspirin to remove. There is a famous research study where kids in, uh, in inner city Chicago lived by the elevated train. So they lived in an apartment right by the elevated train. So the train literally went right by their house. Uh, the train was shut down for a period of several months researchers investigated whether this would have an improvement, uh, this would have positive effect on kids um, work in school. So they went to the kids, families that lived by this elevated train and they, they simply got permission to look at their school records. And they found that these kids improved their grade point average during the time the train was not running by their window. This was negative re reinforcement. Uh, when you take away something that prevents behavior and the behavior improves, our desired behavior goes up. This is negative reinforcement. Sometimes students confuse this, and I will say students all the time confuse this. A mom who takes away a kid's video game because he's misbehaving, this is not negative reinforcement. This is punishment by removal. However, if a mom says, I will remove your video games during the week, you can only play video games on the weekend, and the grades improve during the week, this is negative reinforcement. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, my best example is, is this. I tell students when they come into class, um, they have their phones out and say the phones are on the desk and I say, I'm going to institute a new policy. I'm going to give you an aversive stimulus until the cell phone policy is removed. If I begin banging, clapping my hands very loudly until the cell phones are removed from the desk, that's negative reinforcement. Because what happens the next time if I see a phone, I stop clapping, I start clapping really loud or banging on the desk, then the phones go away. Now, I just use this as an illustration. I don't routinely bang on my test, uh, bang on the desks in my class. But this would be negative reinforcement if a teacher would only stop pounding on the desk when all cell phones were removed. So with classical versus operant conditioning, uh, this is a chart you might want to take a picture of uh, to keep this in your mind, the difference between classical and operant. Now, I will, I will drill down a little to make sure you get the difference. Punishment is any consequence that makes a response less likely. So the application or the addition of an unpleasant stimulus, if a mother yells, that is punishment by application, especially if the mother's yelling because of misbehavior. If there's a corporal punishment, such as a spanking, that is punishment uh, by application. Uh, if, a, if a parent removes something pleasurable, such as a cell phone, 
such as car privileges. This is punishment by removal. Like I said before, I'm going to have a discussion board calling you to differentiate between punishment by removal and negative reinforcement, and this is always difficult. So the key here in, in differentiating these two is one has the result of decreasing negative behavior. That's punishment, right? Parent grounds a kid for coming in late after curfew by taking away privileges to the car and cell phone. All right, so the, therefore the frequency by which they break curfew or miss curfew goes down. That's, that's punishment. Negative reinforcement would be the child, uh, the, the, uh, the adolescent is, uh, gets a stern lecture every time and they really just, they hate the lecture because they don't want to get a lecture, because they don't want to, because they don't want to get in trouble, then they, they actually get home on time. All right, so it's, uh, they're avoiding, one more time, negative reinforcement, the escape avoidance or withdrawal of an adverse stimulus. So negative reinforcement is when the kid avoids punishment by heeding the, uh, by trying to avoid the negative. So severe punishment can produce fear and anxiety, especially when it's unpredictable. And it can model aggression if, uh, if, if it's unpredictable, not consistent, and if it's harsh. So effective punishment should be immediate, it should be consistent, it should be paired with positive reinforcement. Also, negative reinforcement can work very well. All right, and with that, uh, we, will, we will conclude part one of this lecture. I look forward to hearing your post online.